Kia ora everyone and thank you very much to the Foundation North and the Centre for Social Impact to invite me to something that's quite a new experience for me. Um, and um, as this title says, it's not really a formal talk, I just thought I'd just um, say a few things. I was actually asked to talk about really the science of epigenetics and I should say um, it comes from actually sort of my experience with epigenetics from two sides because I'm both a medical doctor who has worked in the ligands as part of a group that used to be headed by Professor Peter Gluckman in Developmental Origins of Health and Disease and Epigenetics, but also um, I'm also sort of philosopher and social scholar of science and I've been writing this book about history of epigenetics for the last couple of years which has been funded through um, Marsden Fund. So thanks to them too. So this kind of has two parts. It's a, it's a bit of science of epigenetics that we um, actually used to do. The group as such doesn't really exist anymore in the institute but other forms of research in the same area are ongoing. And also um, you know, thinking about um, epigenetics as a really social phenomenon and what people understand as epigenetics, um, you know, from scientists to uh, public. I don't even know how to um, say that without science sound like patronizing. Um, and I don't know, wonder, um, I mean, I will assume a little bit of um, some basic biology um, understanding and which is that we understand DNA as the basis of um, our heredity that genes are understood as sort of parts of DNA, and that, um, I mean, there's a bit of more kind of complication, that genes are packaged into chromosomes, that cro chromosomes are in the nucleus of cell. Just to sort of explain some, um, some slides that we follow. Some scientists offer this sort of cellular memory of past stimuli, it's a kind of a short, short version of that. But I think many people, if you ask them what epigenetics is, it would say, it's some kind of memory, some sort of trace, which is in your cells, in your DNA, maybe, uh, and then has a chance to be passed on to the next generation and maybe even further aligned to down sort of multiple generations. Now, there are many definitions of epigenetics in science. The first, this, this middle one is, is incredibly complicated and sort of not very easy to understand. But the first one is what I think most scientists would agree on, and it says these are heritable changes of gene expression not involving changes in the underlying DNA sequence. So that's kind of important. So it's not about changing DNA, there would be mutation, and that has a sort of sound or something very permanent. And it's a change of gene expression. So basically gene remains the same, DNA remains the same, but gene can be either turned on and active, or it can be silenced and inactive. Now, this sort of part heritable is quite important because when you say heritable, most people will think of you know, heredity across generations, intergenerational, or scientists like to make a distinction between intergenerational thinking, so this is something I'm passing on to my child and maybe my, and I'll come back to that, my grandchild, and transgenerational is something that's passed on through kind of beyond these generations that can be actually influenced directly, and I'll, I'll explain why. Actually, heritable doesn't mean that here. It actually means from cell to cell, as cells divide. So it's only actually within one organism. And what happens across generations is something that's relatively controversial. Now, epigenetics is often defined, defined by kind of mechanisms what they are, and this is because it's a relatively new field. Relatively new, I, I mean, I, I take the beginning as kind of 1970s, but I mean, you can sort of define it in very different ways. So basically what you see here in this um, image is kind of goes down is the chromosome, and then you kind of take out the DNA is packaged together with um, proteins in something called nucleosomes. These are like these kind of little balls, and to, so, and these little proteins and small proteins, histones, they can be changed or not changed. And then DNA on top can have um, these kinds of uh, little um, methyl groups, like one carbon, and these methyl groups or methylation is known as the kind of, understood as the most important mechanism of epigenetics. So these are kind of different kinds of biochemical um, mechanisms through which genes can be either active or inactive. 
right? And this is what actually most of science, what geneticists and developmental biologists understand as science of epigenetics, what they study, what these mechanisms are, how permanent are, and so forth. They're really not that interested in a lot of, you know, what actually most people are interested in. Now, um, as I said, epigenetics as a field probably starts in the 70s, and for until probably 1990s or 2000, it was really a field only of interest to the kind of people who would study this. So, <laughs> geneticists, developmental biologists. And it was not about external influences, it was about, because as you can imagine, our, when we start as an organism in understanding science, it starts between the egg and the sperm. They meet, they fuse, and then they start dividing. And we start, and actually somewhere at the beginning, so egg is a very specialized cell, and sperm is a kind of also very special and specialized cell. They meet, and at the beginning, they have to kind of discard all these marks of gene expression that they carry, and they start from the beginning. Because they, and then, as the embryo divides, then the kind of, in different parts of the embryo, different genes are uh, silenced and different genes are active. And this is what epigenetics was for at least 20, 30 years. It was about kind of understanding why in normal development certain genes are active and, and certain genes are not. Now, at some point, um, it was kind of understood in developmental biology, it was sort of 1980s, that while we think that, and we kind of, believed until then that in, when, you know, we inherit two copies, as I said, from, of genes from our parents, that both of these copies are active. Some of, these, some of the genes that we inherit are only active if they are inherited from the mother and only active if they are inherited by the father. There are some particular genes and it's not, and it's kind of long story why that's the case and why it may, might be the case. And this was a kind of a novel thing because for a gene to know, hey, I'm mother's gene and I need to be expressed here, it actually needs to carry this mark through this, as I said, this kind of process when everything is discarded. And this is where actually medicine started to get quite interested in um, actually this new area of epigenetics and where people who were studying development in medicine started to think about, hey, maybe we should study this is actually what they told me, people who studied, and this is fairly recent past. I'm talking about studies that were first published 15 years ago, so not, I'm not 2004, 2005. Maybe all, everything that we could observe in our clinical studies, in our animal studies, for instance, that if you have, I don't know, an undernourished mother or mother who has some sort of pregnancy illnesses, that this child will have, a, not only will be probably very skinny and you know, sick as a baby, but maybe even if you actually fatten it up, later on will maybe have some problems of you know, suffering from cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and so forth. And this is kind of where a lot of fields that we're studying, um, different kinds of ways that the early development or even sort of things that influence the mother came into epigenetics. And this is actually when um, and, and sort of the reasons why now we think about pretty much everything that is about development as epigenetics is quite sort of interesting and complex, and this is what I mentioned in one of the quotes. I think it's because there is a certain level of kind of authority that thinking in sort of molecular and genetic terms has. And it has a higher authority in knowledge or in science, if you want, then when you think about, when you sort of have fields like epidemiology and public health that may have been noticing very similar things, but did not have something to say, oh, methylation is different. And because there is a really, um, yeah, so that's sort of, I mean, a need, and, and we can kind of come back what does this may um, it sort of entail. At the same time, um, there is a recognition in, in last um, in evolutionary biology that was happening for the you know also long time, but perhaps more um, strongly in the last 15, 20 years, that we actually should recognize that DNA is not the be all and end all of our inheritance. There are many ways and many sort of channels through which we as humans, but also I mean this is also animals. Humans are sort of just for some special thing inherit things, like so there is genetic, but we can also talk about non-genetic 
and which, and then, I mean, and this is what uh, now tends to be described as epigenetic, but in the kind of narrow science sense, epigenetic is only part of that. So these kinds of things can be maternal effects. So really it's about, for instance, maternal is, for instance, precisely what happens to the mother, be it nutrition, be it the stress. And we take the developmental period to start before, connection, con uh, before conception, through the pregnancy, and then to go into early years, usually kind of until the weaning, until kind of the biological bond in a way through milk or so, or so forth, but also kind of the closest bond in terms of influence. But you can take it further away. So you can actually then study how this maternal effects through maternal nutrition is mediated through epigenetic change, but also you can look at sort of other kind of clinical signs if you want. What happens is also this grand maternal effect is when the embryo is in maternal, um, in the mother during the pregnancy, that embryo already has its very, very, very early germ cells of very early eggs and not kind of pre uh, progenitor progenitors of, of germ cells so basically the embryo so the offspring the grandchild will already be potentially influenced but what affects through this effect to the very 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 early cells that the embryo has so this is what's the called the grand maternal effect and then the um, niche recreation is basically which means that we um, we change our environment, but our environment changes us. It comes from also evolutionary biology when we understand that like the way that animals sort of change the world around them, including humans who build cities, but also living in cities changes who we are. Social, cultural, that also, for instance, includes the inheritance that we receive through our culture, through our language, through teaching. And then finally, this is like this kind of what is, the, for scientists, the narrowest thing, can we can actually the epigenetic marks be transmitted in the same way the DNA is transmitted. So just copying in a kind of very passive way, generation to generation. So these are the things. So these are the sort of things that where actually I thought that uh, epigenetics has um, really had the kind of impact and the meaning through this because it somehow encapsulated all these different ways of inheritance. And something, I don't know if I'll have time now, but we can come back. What has been interesting is the way, in particular area of um, trauma, some research that was done earlier in the 70s and 80s, and it was looking at the impact of parental trauma on their children was then kind of, it's pretty much the same questions, the same people who were studying the impact of um, trauma of survivors of Holocaust on their children. The, uh, that was actually taken up again around like 2010 and then sort of tested on the, using the epigenetic tools. So, I mean, the, it is probably the most famous study. It's also very controversial and, and many scientists don't kind of agree with its conclusions. Is about the transmission of epigenetic uh, changes of gene expression in children of Holocaust survivors. Um, and what's, I mean, I'll just finish very uh, quickly now. What has actually been very interesting is the way that in, in the last maybe three or five years, it has been taken up by many indigenous groups around the world. Because it kind of encapsulates, I mean, and it is this sort of the, I mean, you, you can see the similarities between Holocaust because it's a kind of a notion of collective and historical trauma and it sort of po uh, political violence that is inflicted on groups of people. And um, what I think has been interesting and different in terms of indigenous groups, and that has been studied actually better in Australia than here, is that the part of this reception is also because the idea of epigenetics fits so well with many of the um, indigenous um, views of individual as not being, is always kind of integrated within the relationships and connections. So you kind of never seen outside the network of your ancestors, of your kin, and this is where these views I actually have found, um, I think the kind of quite um, a, a great resonance. So we can come back with a potential problem. Yeah, thank you.